This is a war without a name. Russia's version of war on terror. A ruthless and endless cycle of terrorist attacks and counter-terrorist operations which killed and wounded close to 500 people this year alone. And for every victim, countless family members scarred forever. <laughs> Civil Navruzova will never forget the September day five years ago when her brother Ramil was killed. She doesn't know the exact circumstances of her brother's death. All she's been told was that he joined an Islamic armed group and that he was killed during an anti-terrorist operation. I still don't know how it all happened. This is a mystery to me and a nightmare. Since then, Civil has been trying to understand the reasons that led her brother and so many others to join Islamists, to understand with the hope of stopping the trend. There is definitely some sort of romantic appeal. The rebels who go into the woods are seen as heroes. They become famous. You can see their photo and read about them on the internet. The secretary of the anti-terrorist commission believes the current troubles in Dagestan are a direct consequence of the wars in neighboring Chechnya. A lot of people came from Arabic countries during the wars and invaded the region. They brainwashed our young men with Islamic propaganda. Dagestan is home to people from 30 different ethnic groups. Unemployment here is twice the national average. Salaries half as high. Add to that high levels of corruption, and you find fertile ground for Islamic preachers. With all this corruption, the lack of jobs, the injustice, it's easy for those who preach jihad to convince youngsters to fight for an Islamic revolution. A very sad situation in the eyes of Ilyena Denisenko from advocacy group Memorial. She considers the Russian state responsible for the poor socio-economic environment in Dagestan, but she mostly blames authorities for the tough methods they use against youngsters who join rebel movements. Our constitution doesn't seem to apply here. Where is the presumption of innocence? If someone is suspected of a crime, there should be an investigation, a proper trial. But that never happens here. Indeed, security forces are engaged in a take-no-prisoner war against presumed terrorists in Dagestan. They rarely get arrested or judged in court. They are mostly killed before they can talk. Elena Denisenko talks about extrajudicial executions. This human rights advocate is also strongly opposed to what she considers collective punishment. Houses destroyed without compensation and families of alleged terrorists harassed. Why should everyone in a village suffer because two or three people joined the terrorists? Villagers are not responsible for this. Last May, police forces broke into Zulaikha Karaneyeva's house and left it heavily damaged. They arrested her husband and bombed her living room, all because, she says, they were looking for her son, Khan, who left the house two years ago. They posted a picture of my son at the gate to let us know that all of this is because of him. They bombed my house, so of course now my son will be afraid to come back. Zarima Bagavudinova is a lawyer who witnessed the raid but couldn't do anything to stop it. Police even broke her phone because she was trying to film the operation. Over the past four years, she says the situation has gone from bad to worse. Clearly, police are now using a tougher approach. Their goal is to put pressure on the population so that everyone turns against the insurgents and their parents. 
A strategy, Zulaikha says, is counterproductive. These methods will just push children to join rebel groups and certainly not bring them back. When we met her, she told us she had little hope of ever seeing her son again. I'd like to tell him that I love him very much. I'd like to ask him to come back home, but after having seen what he did to me, I'm afraid of what they would do to him. Khan Karanayev died three months later. He was 18 years old. He was killed during this special forces raid on the house where he and nine others were hiding. All ten inside died. Over the course of the summer, 76 presumed Islamic extremists were eliminated in such operations in Dagestan. Special forces are increasingly busy as we get closer to Olympic Winter Games in Sochi, just a stone's throw from Dagestan. For Russian authorities, it seems, a strong arm is the best way to solve the problem. We need to make some compromise. We need to find moderate people ready to talk, to negotiate and find a solution. But the ones who call for dialogue are immediately considered suspicious. Shortly after this interview, Zarima Bagavuddinova was arrested by police. But authorities deny using excessive force. The government and the police have no particular desire to use force. When they do, it's because there is no other choice. The best proof of our goodwill is that we created a special commission for readaptation. This commission was set up to get young men out of the woods and help them reintegrate into society. Hoping to help young men like her brother, Sivil Navruzova joined the commission, but so far, the results have been disappointing. She blames a lack of trust on both sides and a lack of will from the authorities. If we want the young men to come back, we need to offer them amnesty. And the government must keep its promises. It's really important that we treat well the first ones that get out of the woods if we want to convince the other ones to follow. These days, Civil spends a lot of time with young men from her neighborhood, trying to raise awareness. This, she knows, is a long-term commitment, a mission she embarked on after her brother's death, to give her life a meaning in a part of the world that seems to have lost all bearings. Jean-François Bélanger, CBC News, Dagestan.